The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. I'm Toby Manhire and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> There's a radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. Can we? Why don't you I, do do the... want, I do want to talk about it because I think you, your guys' reviews of it was re- were really unfair. But you haven't read it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tenakoto Katoa. My name is Toby Matt Hire. Um, I am the editor of the spin-off. And before we begin this Gone By Lunchtime podcast, I would like to formally apologise to Tina Tiller, who is the sound engineer and producer of this podcast. Um, And last week, uh, we fired Tina um, in the middle of the podcast, and that was was an error. Um, the, The circumstances I should probably explain, Tina left the podcast, um, and at that point it seemed very much like a mutiny. She mm. had abandoned Gone yeah. by Lunchtime. It felt, it felt, it felt. It was right at a sensitive it, part of the podcast too, when we were really opening our feelings up and yes. like being vulnerable. Yes. It was like she had ripped open our chests with her bare hands mm. and poured, I don't know, uh, bitumen into... Um, uh, arteries. As politics aficionados, we already feel a deep sense of abandonment by the fourth Labour government in the 1980s, <laughs> and so this really reopens a lot of raw mm. wounds. Kia ora, kia ora, Ben. Um, uh, however, we were wrong. The circumstances were that owing to late running God by Lunchtime recording, which I think was Ben's fault, okay. um, uh, Tina had to... Uh, leave or abandon us to go and attend to a separate podcast being recorded by, was it Duncan Grieve doing one of his media um, numbers? Was he talking to somebody else or just himself again? Uh, he was talking to Sinead. Oh, yeah, Sinead. You just, let the, you just let the tape run with Duncan, don't you? Just um, yeah, le- yeah. Leave, leave him with his cell phone recording and a... A soundproof booth. That's the that's, cut, that's cut, cut, cut the best hour out of the six and yeah, chuck that, it up on the website. Yeah, right. Do they over his head? This podcast called The Fold is very good. Shane Boucher, very good. who is an, an incredibly impressive now owner of stuff and has um, just flipped the bird in a very solid way at Facebook. But that's not what this podcast is about. This is not The Fold. This is an official apology podcast to Tina Tiller, who we wronged. Whom we traduced. If this was the fold, Tina would probably stay for the whole thing. <laughs> uh, that's true. That's true. Um, so anyway, I want to apologise for that, Tina. Um, uh, this has gone by lunchtime. What else? Before we get into it, we're going to, probably going to talk about David Clark, who uh, who resigned um, uh, for different reasons. It wasn't related to um, the fold. walking out of a podcast. Mm. Um, you wanted Ben Ben Thomas. Hi. Hi, Toby. Hi, Annabelle. Annabelle Lee Mather. Hi. Kia ora. Um, thanks to Flick Electric, who make this podcast possible. Um, we're gonna gonna we're gonna turn it up and go weekly shortly. Mm. Maybe next week. Maybe we'll take a week. I who, who can say? If you've ever wanted to join the spin-off members, now would now would be a time to get great value. That is a great contribution. That's a, that's a great point. I'm such a crazer. <laughs> um, do make, join make us podcast members. millionaires. The. Um, you requested Ben Thomas. Uh, Judith Collins has a book out. It's called Pull No Punches. Uh, 
not very many punching, many punch, punch, punch punches in it. But do, do you wanted to read? Do you want to read from it? I, no, want? I, I want to hear your sonorous ASMR like voice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to read one sentence because I thought this did strike me as a bit of a sentence. Um, this is on page two of chapter one, uh, a chapter called Decision Time, and this is an amazing sentence which I would like to read to you. <clears throat> By now. Having ejected Prime Minister Jim Bolger for New Zealand's first female PM, Jenny Shipley, and losing the support of Winston Peters' New Zealand First Party on the way, but keeping some of Peters' former MPs as ministers and trying to keep on board the vote of the ex-Alliance MP, Alamein Kopu, quite a few New Zealanders seem to think that National was toast. Is that one sentence? It's one sentence. Wow. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, I, I think it uh, captures the chaos of the time. I I haven't I've, I've got my I got my copy the day it came out from the women's bookstore in Ponsonby, yeah, yeah, yeah. which I had reserved. Yeah, and um, I haven't I haven't read it yet. I haven't had time, but yeah. I really want to devote devote some time and sort of treat myself, light some candles, and you know, mm. run about. And, and I I've read a few of the reviews, including your own, which I think are a little unfair. Mm. Um, some people have said that there's a slightly flat prose style. Um, which I think, you know, you can ameliorate if you, if you read it in your head in Judith Collins' voice. Mm. So, you know, when she was doing her press about the book, the, something that came up a lot was her quote, I, I'm not sure if it's in the book or not, where she says, you know, I could never be ruthless like John Key. And, mm. you know, on the face of it, you're like, well, that's just a sort of nothing comment. But mm. if you read it in Judith's voice, it's sort of like, well, I could never be ruthless like John Key is. And then I think it gives the whole different tenor to the... <laughs> you mean with a slight raised eyebrow and a kind of glance <laughs> off camera and then it suddenly seems like... I mean, look, I'm going to accept that your critique of my review of a book that you haven't read is sound. Um and we're, we're in the political the, commentary game, it baby. Will, it will resonate much more strongly when you are in your bath, uh, <laughs> lying naked with petals floating around on the surface and several dozen candles burning. Um, and I don't know, maybe some, some Enya on the <laughs> soundtrack. Mm, what beautiful. Are you? I, I, Essential oils essential. forming a, a, a silky film on the top of the bath water. Beautiful. Um, We'll be we'll be live streaming Ben Thomas <laughs> reading Judith Collins' book um, uh, shortly. Um, I look, I really wanted to enjoy the book. Honestly, I did, and it's not without merit. It has some interesting stuff, and in it kind of gets kicking a bit when she gets into um, the stuff around uh, who was the Canadian judge. Oh, Ian Binney. Ian Binney, who does mm. seem like a bit of a dick. Was um, that the guy that did the David Bain yes, review? The the David Bain. Yeah, he was, he, was, he was a judge who was brought in to be an independent expert and then some seemed somewhat mm. captured by yeah, the subject. Yeah. Yeah. You know, became, became a sort of real personal crusader mm. for the Bain cause. And I think that's, uh, that's a strong chapter. And then towards the end, she kind of lays out her, you know, how can national win type stuff and points up there and gets a bit manifesto y and, you know, arguably seems a bit like a uh, pitch for the leadership, although it really doesn't do so in any kind of um, visceral way. But uh, look, it, I wanted to like it. It just it just felt like it felt like dutiful. The whole book felt like a dutiful recounting of things that happened without a great deal of punch. I think it's hard to write a memoir um, midway through your career you know, while you're still in Parliament and I think it's, you know, it stands out that the most of the criticism is reserved for Bill English and for John Key, who are no longer on the scene. Um, so I think if, you know, for, for the real warts and all uh, story, I think, you know, you probably want to wait, you know, three or four years after their career. Um, speaking of which, uh, my old boss, Chris Finlayson, has a book that's coming out, uh, I, think, I think, later this year, um, less, less memoirish, more sort of about his experience with the Crown Māori relationship and where he sees it heading, but um, I'm I'm hoping that there'll be a few tidbits in it. Does it have a chapter about his uh, um, sort of engaging and enlightening time spent with his um, uh, media advisor, senior media advisor, and the provenance of the incredible term the golden age of New Zealand <laughs> culture? I'm not sure if hashtag golden age has its own. Um, Does he even chapter. know that he did those tweets? Uh, I mean, I think he was aware of the gist. Um, Annabelle, can I? I'm interested to know your um, opinion and view of the Judith Collins book. I know you haven't read it, but that didn't stop Ben. No, I, I haven't read it. I don't, it. Just picking up on what Ben said earlier, is it perhaps slightly premature, a bit like a JoJo Siwa best of album? 
mm. so early in one's career. Right. Um, like when you go through the bit and you go, oh, best of, and you think, I mm, love that, and right? then the biggest hits aren't there. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's unusual timing. Hmm. Well, I, I mean, look, if you were being, if you were being cynical, you'd say that uh, Colin sat down to write this at a time when National probably weren't uh, ahead in the polls, um, as they sort of came to be sort of near the end of last year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there there is a, you know, it is, um, it discusses sides of Judith Collins that we don't sort of see in the in the media in terms of her sort of crusher persona, her, you know, mm-hmm. almost cartoonish mm-hmm. sort of um, role that she often plays in politics. She is much more complex than that. Um, and it does settle a few old scores, but again, only with people who are no longer there. And so you could say that, you know, should there have been any uncertainty about the result of the 2020 election, it might be it might be a, an opportune time to sort of reposition yourself as, you know, less kind of, you know, far right as she's often portrayed, you know, should the leadership come up, you know, after the election, um, you know, and, and there's a few there's a few politicians pro- probably trying in that space right now as well. Simon Bridges, um, notoriously unlikable as National Party leader, is now um, doing something of a social media rehabilitation, wandering around with yaks and showing off beautiful family film of himself at his marae as a, as a small child um, and, you know, and, and, and showing a bit of the, the softer side of Simon. He's, he's, a, he's a, achieved something extraordinary. I don't know if you've been following this, um, Annabelle, Simon Bridges' um, kind of reinvention. I'm as, just hopping on the Twitter now to have a look. Is it on the Twitter? Yeah. Hold the line. Um, Continue. I think you'll find that the, <clears> the, the big sigh re- retweeted... Um, my post there. Oh my god! Um, what is that? It's an actual yak. Where is he's he? He's with a yak. He's with a yak. <coughs> I think somewhere down south. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm, I'm getting emotional. He's with a yak. <laughs> he's with a yak. He's got he's got a Roxy Music t-shirt on, gum boots, <laughs> and it's just the definition of contentment. You know, like sometimes when people ask you, as they do in the creative writing night classes. Could you um, articulate your idea of happiness and contentment? And sometimes you struggle and you just know, now know it's wearing a Roxy Music T-shirt and gumboots, wandering down a pasture with mm. a beautiful plains reaching out towards you while petting a baby yak. Am I wrong? You're not wrong at all, and I'm loving it. And the amazing thing he's done... Good for you, Simon. You cuddle the shit out of that baby yet. He's managed to unite all of New Zealand, and um, amazingly. And by all of New Zealand, I mean all of Twitter, which, as we know, is completely representative of all of New Zealand. Mm, indeed. All the way around from the... the, 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 the I, I mean, I posted that that yesterday and I've got accolades from Democracy Mum for it. <laughs> Democracy Mum loves it and then every you know, the, the the very left of New Zealand Twitter loves it and it's he's brought us together. Look, a lot of people have strong post political careers and Simon Bridges seems to be having one while he's still a politician. And that's I think we should all just be happy for him. Mm-hmm. He also, but also, well, I think we'll get onto it a bit later. The uh, the reshuffle. It's also the the opposition spokesperson on foreign affairs. Yeah, he just went. It doesn't help you much. You don't really get visits of state when you're the opposition spokesperson on foreign affairs. But. No, but it, you, but but you know, it's a it's still a bit of a kind of um, it, 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 it's a position that many covet, right? You know, it that's right. The, yeah, has the has the air of um, a seniority and patrician. Nature, an elder statesman as Bridges now is, and funsies like lots of trips overseas, like eating lounges. cup sandwiches, lounges, and, yeah, yeah, limos, yeah, koru lounge, like all the time, the super koru lounge, the, the super kind of koru lounge in the koru lounge, yeah, motorcades, the VIP was, section of the koru lounge. I was talking to former prime ministerial press secretary because I, you know, I did treaty settlements, so you know. We just we just used to take a car to a marae and wait or hmm. you know, but which I mean it's great you know it's nice to back your backyard whatever, but the the PM staff you know they would get like motorcades with military mm. helicopters mm. in mm. Washington DC mm. or you know put Japanese outrider motorcycles with mm. batons to mm. beat off the crowd mm. you know should anyone like 
try and run at John Key for an autograph or something. There's a there's a there's a, there was a very good but um, we interviewed Clark Gayford a couple of years ago. It was fishing mostly, but he had a very good bit in it about the traveling around Europe and America with the Prime Minister as the first man or whatever, and just comparing the motorcades of the different countries <laughs> and how you could tell from the motorcade a sort of something about the kind of national culture of a country. It's very funny. It's very good. Um, now, I suppose at some point we should move from, oh, this is good, move from Clark Gayford to David Clark. Oh, what a segue. Incredible. Um, just... <laughs> Smooth as silk, but, uh, you are. Um, this is just one take. <laughs> Tina, Tina doesn't even need to be here. She we'll just well, like just, <laughs> just put it straight up. That's incredible. It's just like it's flowing like the ocean's waves. Mm. The um, it's it feels it, like a masterclass in podcastery. Um, <clears throat> David Clark resigned last week, um, in one of those very much uh, he jumped. And wasn't pushed, but he jumped after um, being given no alternative but to jump. Is there a better way of putting that? Probably there is. Um, uh, and, you know, it's one of those things you kind of retrace his sins. And there is no absolutely shocking, egregious, appalling sin so much really as a kind of collection of things. And going back to breaking the rules during lockdown where you can't have your health minister doing that. Uh, at which point he tendered his resignation, which was rejected by the Prime Minister, saying that you, it's time like this, but basically effectively um, making him a lame duck. And then he was absent for much of the, you know, the crunch times in the COVID-19 response. He was in Dunedin and not mm. visible, um, despite being the health minister. And then there was that kind of, the real nail in the coffin was that, the, as, 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 as I think Hayden Donnell put it, it was the first time that I, that are maybe the first time that a, a camera pan has ended a career. Mm. You know, the, 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 the news hub pan from David Clark, who was re refusing to accept responsibility for the failures at the border, um, and then the camera pan to Ashley Bloomfield, who is, of course, beatified as New Zealand's leading celebrity pin-up saint. Um in the end, it felt like there was no alternative. Annabelle, mm. what do you think? What do you think? I mean, is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it in the end harsh? Or? Well, I think, I mean, to be fair, whoever becomes the Minister of Health, you know, and here it's a bit of a clusterfuck. Mm. Um, and I think, um, you know, he has made some gains during his time in the role, you know, a couple of... Um, um, increases in funding and, you know, more focus on mental health. But I think that it was a mistake for Jacinda not to exit him once the lockdown was over. I understood why she didn't do it during lockdown, and I think even Simon Bridges himself said that he probably wouldn't have fired him mm. during Level 4, but I think after that she probably should have because he had clearly lost the confidence of New Zealanders and frankly other New Zealanders were being prosecuted for lockdown breaches and he had committed to. So I think, um, you know, I thought she was a bit flat footed in that regard. Um, and then to make matters worse was the incident with Ashley Bloomfield who rightly or wrongly has been become like a deity in New Zealand during lockdown and let's be honest he's done a pretty incredible job so I think I think not only did that show really poor judgment on his part um, and I kind of wonder when you go back and you watch that video if just slightly changing the language would have made a difference like if he had said we accept that there's been major problems at the border we accept that it's our responsibility we need to fix them I think that would have made all the difference instead of just saying just the, you know the um what's his official title the director general of health yeah. accepts I think if he'd used we that would have been a lot more palatable to a lot more yeah. New Zealanders but I think it was the hypocrisy that really it was alienated people. Absolutely. And it was the same on, on Checkpoint when he did it. You were just, you were almost kind of sort of 
trying to standing there with the script on the in the in the in 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 the aisles wanting to shout the line to him. It's like it's like, it's not that hard. It's like um, Ashley Bloomfield has accepted responsibility for the operational failures, and then it's easy. However. I am the Minister of Health and mm. I take responsibility for the operation mm. as a whole and mm. I will never shirk from that responsibility. Yeah, it absolutely. is all I do every day when I wake up, when I go to bed. Blah, 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 blah. It's not, yeah, like, it's, not ha- it's not rocket science. Ben, you're a political political maestro, you know. You, how, is, is that, are, we, are we understating how straightforward that is? And if we're right, why are we sacking someone for a failure to do a sort of politically optical rhetorical thing yeah so there's this concept called ministerial responsibility which because you know as as you pointed out in an excellent piece on the spin-off and i never tire of talking about in public um you know this excuse that oh the failure at the border with the two women getting out and absorbing to wellington was an operational <laughs> issue is you know everything the government does is operational right you know mm. Ca- mm. cabinet cabinet just sits and votes on stuff and then they have armies of civil servants who go out and, and uh, public servants who go out and actually implement it and make it a reality right you know if you know, uh, it's an operational matter that Kiwi Build failed completely, and and three hundred houses got built instead of a hundred thousand. Right? It's an operational failure if um, if people are denied benefits that they're entitled to. But the only but but as the public, we don't have any way of influencing or leveraging uh, those public servants. That happens on a political level through the ministers who are responsible for them, and they can do that by demanding information, getting updates on what's happening, having meetings, making clear their expectations. Um, and if they're just if they're not going to do that, you know that, that's their responsibility, ministerial responsibility. Now in the old days, it used to be very high. Th- you know, it used to be a, a, a very. Um, a high level of obligation. So Dennis Marshall was probably the last really high point of that. He was the Minister of Conservation during the Cave Creek disaster in the early 90s. But basically there was a dock viewing platform in a national park that had not been properly maintained, mm. it crashed, killed a lot of people. Mm. Very sad, um, you know, a tragedy. Mm. Dennis Marshall wasn't personally responsible for nailing in and bolting on um, dock viewing platforms, but he resigned because he was the minister. And, you know, overall, the operation of DOC was his, you know, making sure that it was working well was his responsibility. Since then, we've seen a real reduction in the the, the actual level of responsibility ministers are willing to take. Mm. And now it is becoming more of an optical thing. You often see ministers saying, I take full response, you know, and we've seen Mm. the prime minister do it and say, I take full responsibility for that. And then nothing happens. You know, they just say that they've taken full responsibility. In the same way that Ashley Bloomfield said, I've taken responsibility for what happened, but nothing actually happened to him except that he had a hangdog look when David Clark ran him down on TV. Right, but also just to, to, to add, is I mean, the, the ministerial responsibility is not something that is absolute. It's not as though you take responsibility for something and therefore you resign. Ministerial responsibility doesn't and never has worked like that. It's not, yes, if there's something of a particular... Pro, it's, it's, it's proportionate to what has happened, is what I'm trying to say. Y- yeah, that's right. But so there, there should at least be... You know, an undertaking that I'm going to get on top of this. Oh, I've failed and I can see how I can do better. Mm. You know, that, I mean, that's the bare minimum the public wants. They want you to see how you've fucked up and how you're going to address it. I mean, you know, it's pretty basic. Um, and David Clark, in, instead of doing that, you know, just sort of said, well, the Ministry of Health, who a large building over there that I've seen a couple of times has stuffed something up and I'm really hoping that things improve in the future. I can't wait for the next briefing to the incoming minister after the election to see how things have gone. Um, you know, and, and of course that's not going to be good enough. So he, he had his sit down with the prime minister where according to her, she said that she wanted the f- attention and focus to be on the government's response to COVID-19 and there were certain matters that were proving to be a distraction and they couldn't afford distractions and then I imagine Jacinda I do like <laughs> staring straight at David Clark while she's saying that and then <laughs> him just kind of smiling broadly <laughs> and then her going like there are certain distractions <laughs> and him nodding and going well with the renewed confidence you've shown in me after lockdown I think we can overcome anything Jacinda <laughs> and 
<laughs> and then it sort of percolated in David Clark's brain for about a week, and then I th- then he resigned, right? So, um, which you know was was the only you know only possible outcome because um, normally poorly performing or inept ministers kind of recede into the background during an election campaign because we have these presidential major party leaders one-on-one match-up kind of campaigns these days. Uh, but that wouldn't have been possible here because it's COVID election, and so your Minister of Health is going to be front and centre, which I think is why Chris Hipkins, the um, interim Minister of Health, looked so terrified when he was standing next to Jacinda Ardern as she announced his new role. And Hipkins has been appointed, he's now the kind of Minister of um, unwieldy big departments, basically. <laughs> um, and he has, you know, um, he has done you'd have to say, a strong, uh, scandal-free job with the really unwieldy Ministry of Education. You know, there are so many different moving parts in education, and that is where he's impressed. He's actually pushed change through um, and across the different sectors. Do you, and, and, and yet, one of the um, lines that the national opposition has been using is, what is it, that there are sort of however many empty seats there are, you know, that there are only a small group, a nucleus of talent in the Labour Party and a lack of depth, which is a bit of a, which is a, a, an interesting, <clears throat> you might say, defeatist line to take going into an election campaign where most people are going to be focused on the leader and you're implicitly saying we can't match you on that. But do they have a point, Annabelle, do they have a point that there are basically, you know, you look at Jacinda Ardern, Grant Robertson, uh, Chris Hipkins, David Parker, and then you start sort of looking around the room but Megan Woods mm. is obviously impressed with her with her coming to that role but is that is that a fair criticism well i think it's it probably is a fair criticism but it's also a case of the pop calling the kettle black because i don't think they really have a whole lot of depth on on their side either and i i also think it's cyclical like this is a government that wasn't really expecting to be a government they had reached the place in their kind of electoral cycle where you know before this they were being criticized for having a whole lot of old fuddy duddies mm. on and that they needed to refresh their ranks and bring through new MPs and all of that so that happened and then um, they spent some time out in the cold and sort of unexpectedly became government. So it's true, they they don't have a whole lot of experience. But frankly, when you look across the other side of the room, there's not a whole lot of depth there either, starting with um, the leader of the National Party. Um, so I think, yeah, perhaps it is a fair criticism, but I think in terms of um, Chris Hipkins' appointment, I mean, let's be honest, there's only a couple of months left to the election. Um, He's been a pretty safe pair of hands with education. There hasn't been any, you know, major dramas like what we saw with the last national government with the closure of schools and merging classrooms and national standards and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So, and, you know, we obviously have a very capable woman um, waiting in the wings. So I don't think there's a whole lot to be read into this. I just think that they probably need more time and to be a bit more judicious with the way they um, uh, hand out their por- portfolios and the support they wrap around their ministers because they, they need more flying hours, frankly. I think it is an interesting <coughs> point that, um, you know, this is an underpowered cabinet. Mm. I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah. We were talking about that on the pod even before mm. uh, the election, you mm. know, that Labour was go- would have problems putting together um, a strong cabinet. In this country, we've been very lucky um, in the sense that the last, almost the last 20 years, you know, since, or actually the last 20 years since um, Helen Clark's government was elected in 1999. She had a, a formidable lineup of top ministers, mm. um, and you know, only really started to see kind of shows of weakness and sort of incompetence, kind of in that last term of theirs. Same with Key's government. You know, very strong top lineup, and then you know, started to show a few sort of strains and buckles um, in their last three years. But we've kind of gotten used to the idea that there will be all of these kind of Mm. super brains and incredibly hard workers and incredibly competent people backing up the PM. And, you know, and and 
one of the things we're seeing is that's not inevitable. You know, mm. the, you, I think you're right that um, it's not a very impressive cabinet that we have, but the opposition is certainly not as impressive as the National Party lineup five mm. years ago, mm. um, and they're, they're probably some way away from you know getting to that level. Hello there, Simon Pound here from another spin-off podcast with a little bit of cross-promo for you. If you might be into the stories of Aotearoa's most interesting entrepreneurs and innovators, you might like to check out Business is Boring, the podcast I host that reckons it's anything. But if that sounds like a bit of you, it's available through the spin-off or wherever you find your favourite podcasts. Um, we had a piece on the spin-off on Saturday morning um, by the uh, inimitable Donna Chisholm, an interview with Claire Curran, who, who, Donna. who, um, who resigned herself from Cabinet um, and is now leaving Parliament um, after a, a series of controversies befell, is that the word? Befell her? Um, befelded, I think it is. I think bef- they befelded her. Oh. And uh, the, the story kind of does kind of seep into the David Clark one a bit because there was certainly an um, amount of uh, um, schadenfreude maybe or certainly a kind of a targeted attack on David Clark much of which of course why wouldn't there be the whole idea is that we criticise him but did you did you did you catch that piece Annabelle on the weekend? Yeah, I had a brief look over yeah. it. Yeah, um, and it's 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 quite a quite a quite a, a really powerful piece I yeah. think because it, it included um, you know there's no pro like Donna so it certainly didn't um, let Claire Curran off the hook in no. terms of enumerating uh, the mm. the things that befelled her but it also foregrounded her perspective right which mm. we haven't had before and it's. It's interesting, and her her account is, you know, she's basically had PTSD from Mm. politics, no joke. Uh, She had a terrible, terrible time. She faced kind of bullying from even within her own party. Do you think there is a sense, and I say this conscious that our very podcast is called Gone by Lunchtime, which arguably revels in the idea of departing politicians. Mm. Is Is there a sense in which the blood sport of politics is too much and that... I don't, I don't know. Like, I've been thinking about this a bit lately. I wonder whether, is there, do we all, politicians, the media, all of us, mm. have an obligation to think more carefully about the kind of language we use and the attacks we make? Well, I think if we're, you know, as a country, I think if we're serious about, um, you know, the mental health crisis um, that we're experiencing, mm. that we should probably be a bit more measured in, in the way we um, hold people to account. Um, I don't think anyone should get off lightly, and I do think people should be asked the hard questions, but some of the stuff that was in the in the article, which talked about you know a toilet seat with Claire Curran's um, face on it hmm. is absolutely abhorrent. Now, I think any politician that goes into Parliament goes in knowing full well that 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 um, you know being held to a account and being under the glare of the the media spotlight goes with the territory. But I don't think most people go in expecting to literally be pissed on. Um, so I do think that we that there needs to be a bit of a shift, and I'm surprised that the media hasn't gone harder on um, on Michael Woodhouse this week. Um, I do think that Claire's probably um, part of the fallout of what we were discussing earlier in terms of inexperienced cabinet ministers, and um, and. I mean, when you look at what happened with the Derek, is it Derek Handley? Derek Handley, yeah. A- and, um, you know, the Carol Hirschfeld issue, like she paid a high price and, um, and you know, it's good that we that we set a high standard for our, for our ministers. Um, but, yeah, perhaps we do need to think a little more carefully, carefully about the way in which we, um, in which we critique them. Mm. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think you can. I think it's easy enough for us as commentators to draw a 
pretty clear distinction between the kinds of you know bullying or harassment that's off off limits, right? Mm. And that's talking about people's appearance, talking about people's weight. You know, um, Paula Bennett, uh, Paula Bennett get, got that a lot. People talking about her appearance. Jerry Brownlee still gets fat jokes in the house from the deputy prime minister of all people, and people reported and tweeted and go, "Ah oh, ha ha, Winston's so witty," right? And, uh, you know, and, and gendered, racist, uh, you know, any kind of bigoted language, you know, should be off limits. Um, Putting someone's face on a toilet seat and just included in that off limits category. It's, it's, pretty, it's yeah. pretty gross, right? Yeah. Woodhouse didn't do that. That was a, no, a volunteer's thing. Yeah. And, you know, and, and party, party, party volunteers, mm. taken, party yeah. volunteers yeah. are often pretty gross, yeah. I find. Um, and you... you but then, and then we can easily distinguish that from criticism of their performance in their jobs. You know, Chris Claire Curran was a terrible minister. She was the minister of open government and said that they would be the most open and transparent government of all time. And then she was busted having secret meetings, not just once but twice. That's that's literally a, a joke. That's like mm. a, a Mando Iannucci line from you know the thick of it or Veep. It's a very funny joke, and it's one that she authored both you know in the setup and the punchline. So that stuff is like totally within limits. Now the problem is that we can distinguish easily between that, but I don't think politicians can. Um, and I think that came through in the Claire Curran interview is that she was she was unable to. Um, to disentangle legitimate and illegitimate mm. criticisms. And this is part of, you know, the sort of people that you get in politics, right? Which is that, you know, we're all the hero of our own movie, right? Or the main character in our own story. And po and the sort of people who seek political office and power are, you know, that to the nth degree. And there has to be a mechanism of holding them to account, right? Because, you know, as we saw with David Clark, you know, they... Often they won't come to these conclusions on their own. <laughs> you know, they have to be sat down. And even, and, and even when David Clark was walked through why he probably had to resign as Minister of Health, it still took him about a week to think about it. And Claire Curran still hasn't figured out, you know, exactly what she did wrong in her ministerial capacity. Um, and that, of course, in no way excuses the harassment and no way mm. means that she deserves, you know, the terrible experience she's had at all, right? This is a systemic thing in terms of, you know, how do you hold to account people who don't want to take responsibility for mm. things? And, 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 you know, we saw that with Jamie Lee Ross, right? Who decided to chime in on the whole issue and talk about the dehumanizing and is, is that, you know, again, he was seeing it as part of his personal journey. And, you know, and how how is he going, you know, has he come through all of this a better person? No mention of the, like, the staff that he allegedly harassed or abused. No mention, no mention in Curran's case of, you know, breaches of rules, you know, that are there for a reason in terms of probity and due process with the Carol Hirschfeld interview. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that. It, it is very important because we've got to remember this is this is not just people who turn up to a job, you know, collecting trash cans or whatever, and you've got to make sure that they they you know can do that in a safe environment. These are people who want the power to shape society, tell us all how to live, spend all of our money. Um, Claire Curran wanted to reshape the entirety of the public broadcasting sector. Um, that's a power that none of us have, and. You know, and, and, and facilitating her personal journey to do that is not the obligation of the public or the media or other politicians. You, know, you see this with uh, Hillary Clinton. You know, you know, she wanted to be president from when she was a girl. Uh, she worked so hard for it. Why couldn't she be president? No refer, you know, and, 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 and often the, the US public or the public good would recede into the background about, you know, in terms of her personal journey. And I think that's a, a fundamentally unhealthy way to look at politics. There is, however, there is one thing that I just want to mm. bring up, which I think the clear current thing focuses on. There is, a, I think there is a real unfairness in the sense that Claire Curran did fold and, you know, and, and couldn't deal with the pressure Whereas somebody like David Clark, in similar circumstances, seemed perfectly content to sort of battle on without any of the kind of self-doubt that afflicted her. You know, there's that cliche, you know, God give me the confidence of a mediocre white man. And I think, and you know, I, th I think, you know, I started off sort of saying this is a troll, you know, a while back about, you know, what does it take for Jacinda Ardern to sack a white man with David Clark? But actually, the more I've thought about it, 
you know, when, when the Prime Minister was asked about competence in her cabinet on the weekend on The Nation, she said um, Chris Hipkins, fair, David Parker, fair, Damien O'Connor, probably fair, Pro Primary Industries, Stuart Nash, well, has he been particularly competent? She only mentioned white men. She didn't mention Carmel Cipollone. She didn't mention Kelvin Davis. Um, Chris Farfoy, you know, the Mr. Fix-It for much of the government's first term. And, I, you know, and it does seem that... You know, I mean, this is probably, you know, a pretty obvious thing, but, you know, about, you know, by inherent biases, but it does seem that we attach ideas of competence to white men in suits a bit mm. more readily than we do other people. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky one to square, isn't it? Because the, it's true that the nature of the system is such that there is going to be, you know, it's at, at root, it's adversarial. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be disagreement. There's going to be antagonism. And yet, and Jess Berenstain Shaw makes this point in a piece of that for the spin-off this morning. If we agree that we want our politics, our parliament, to be, be truly representative, to uh, include people from all different backgrounds, walks of life, you know, I mean, not just in terms of ethnicity and gender, but also in terms of, like, almost personality types, you know, all those sorts of different things, then if... A, a, a requirement for entering that arena is to have the hide of an ox. You know, is to be is there, there is there. I don't I don't know what the answer to that is, and I think clearly accountability has to be right up there. But there's a we could do better, don't you think? Oh, I definitely think we can do better. But I but I also think that you're naive if you think you're going to go into parliament and not get the shit kicked out of you at some point. But I do think that as a country, we can, you know, lift our standards in terms of the way that we critique our our politicians, and for them to to lead by example as well. Okay, well, let's keep moving. Um, <laughs> as, the as, they, as, they say, as they say in Te Ao Māori, at, there's a saying for that in Te Ao Māori, which is "patua te kaupapa, kaua ko te tangata, attack the issue, not the person." I think that's a yeah. Um, the 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 let's keep moving was the slogan that was unveiled on Saturday morning in the Labour Party Congress, um, which is like the kind of micro version of the longer version Labour conference that happens in non-election years. Cinder Ardern gave a speech which was reasonably short on policy announcements, given mm. what you would necessarily... You know, this is a party event, um, and there have obviously been a shitload of announcements um, over the last, you know, three months. So many announcements that they're kind of unimaginable. Um, but uh, there wasn't... There was, you know, there was a, the, the, the small business loan scheme was extended, but otherwise, there wasn't a lot there, was there, Ben? Yeah, but I, I don't think there needs to be. I mean, you often see this when when I was um, working in government. You know, the National Party would, you know, people would say, "What's the National Party's policy?" And it's like, well, technically, the National Party's policy is what they're doing now because they're in government, right? Mm, you yeah. know, they've they've already flagged a lot of what they're doing in the future in the budget. Um, you know, and they and they, they keep in in reserve promises for the campaign to make a splash. Mm. Here, there's absolutely no pressure on the Labour Party to do that. Like, we know that they have $20 billion that they're going to pretty much announce, you know, in terms of spending in the next 12, uh, 11 weeks. Um, I, I don't think it's a huge problem that they didn't uh, make a big splash on Sunday. You know, that, it's, it's more a rah-rah, you know, rev up the supporters. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, they, they unveiled their amazing new slogan, let's keep moving. Well, isn't that enough for you, Toby? You shark. Like, <laughs> what, what will satisfy you? It's probably quite a good strategic move. Like, I've heard the criticism that they that, that it was pretty light on policy. I mean, there's mm. some sort of interesting-looking stuff in there, like the, is it jobs for nature? Yeah, they filled in a bit of the detail on the, the uh, earlier spending they had announced. Yeah. Disagree with jobs for people, well, surely. But, <laughs> but, I mean, it, it sounds like a good idea in theory, but I think, you know, so long as it doesn't end up looking like, you know, a chain gang. Um, but I, I, I kind of think strategically perhaps it's a good idea that they haven't announced too much because hmm. then it gives the National Party, um, like, three months to pick their policy to shreds mm. like they did with the um, capital gains tax. Mm. Um, everybody knows they're sitting on a big, fat checkbook. So... 
Yeah, it would have been. It, it, it may be. It, it may be that they'll wait until you know closer, and then we'll start to, to see the launch the little, itself. The lolly, be, the lolly start yeah, to trickle yeah. out of the and, bag. And and I guess given that <clears> if we hadn't had these um, massive events, of events that have befelled us, the um, mm. uh, you know like incredible. Incredible once in a generation events in New Zealand, right? Like in, in terms of what happened in Christchurch, March 15th, and, and in terms of uh, the COVID 19 crisis, that we would probably be talking now about delivery and the, the delivery. Do you remember? Mm. You know, it's like, do you remember? Oh, that's right. The year of delivery. It was the year of delivery last year. Do you remember? Um, and that, that, would, that would obviously play into nationals' hands. So to make bold announcements mm. and have an election about bold announcements like building heaps of houses or building mm. light rail networks is not necessarily a very smart strategy beyond which as you you know as as you mentioned Ben it's like the if it's an election based on the response to COVID-19 and there's a pretty reasonable argument to be made that it should be you know that's not a that's not a disingenuous argument then then that's going to benefit Labour so as far as they can keep it that way and dovetail the response to the crisis with their campaign for re-election, all the better. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So normal. So when you're in government, there's there's a distinction between the government and the party that's campaigning to be in government in the next term, right? But that distinct that that wall between those two things is very very thin right now because the public expects that there will be this ongoing rolling mall continued response in real time to the COVID to COVID and the economic crisis caused by COVID, which really frees up the Labour as the government to spend government money rather than just making uh, promises as a political party should they win office, which is what you normally do in a campaign. So I mean, this is this is actually a much better position for Labour to be in. You know, they'll they'll be de- they'll be literally depositing money into people's bank accounts through probably the wage. I, I would say the wage uh, subsidy will be extended closer to the election. They'll be able to, as the government announced things like a Trans Tasman travel bubble. Um, you know, I I don't think. If political journalists are worried that there aren't enough announcements coming from Labour, I think that they can uh, put aside their concerns. And do you have anything to add to that, or, sh- or do we just need to apologise to Tina again? Yeah, we can say sorry to Tina. Yeah, I'm very sorry. Oh, are we going to say anything about Paula? About oh, Paula, Paula. Paula Bennett's left politics. Imagine Apparently, that. Yeah. Paula left with um, Judy Collins danced her way out of politics alongside Tom Sainsbury. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, well, what explain that to us, Ben. Paula Bennett just went, you know what, can't be fucked. Right, that was it, right? Like, it was basically a, um, whatever she was, <coughs> 13th in Cabinet, I'm not going to be Deputy Prime mm. Minister again. Yeah. I can't see a path to that. Um, and I'm out. Yeah, Paula, Paula peaked. She was Deputy Prime Minister. Um after the coup, you know, and she, and she remained <laughs> deputy leader after um, Bill English was uh, after Bill English resigned after the election, and Simon Bridges became leader. Mm. She was really great, you know, a bit of a bit of a survivor. Um, you know, she's had her critics within caucus, uh, people who thought that maybe a shtick, you know, got a bit tired. Um, that that she she was she was seen as a very good social development minister for uh, national in the way that she she could connect with audiences that a lot of national MPs you know stuffy old men in suits couldn't when she left that role don't know if beneficiaries and, would necessarily agree with that Ben did but she anyway. ever come onto your program Annabelle I remember no, you asked her no, something like no. 300 weeks in a row to come onto the I think the it was home. about 22,000 times <laughs> yeah. to be yeah. accurate yeah 11.7 billion Yes, over the course of yeah. five years, yeah. about that much. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I want to acknowledge her as the first Wahine Māori to be um, Deputy Prime Minister, and, you know, certainly she was a colourful character, didn't take herself too seriously, held a really wide range of um, portfolios and I guess was considered a safe pair of hands, like... Certainly not by beneficiaries, as I mentioned earlier, but by but by her bosses. I think safe pair of hands for pulling the ladder up behind her. Is that's right. Sort of strong, said, yeah. strong yeah. hands. Strong ladder hands. <laughs> strong ladder hands. I think. Um, I think what kind of marks her out is that she was one of those politicians who was happy to be a deputy, and wasn't kind of nipping at the heels of their 
of their leader, you know, that ominous threat of, you know, rolling them at all times. So kind of Cullen-esque in that regard, which, you know, probably stood her in good stead. Um, she was great at fronting up to the media, except to us. Um, <laughs> Not to the hurry. I think, you know, the way she resigned um, was probably one of the more impressive um, resignations from Parliament. I, as, you know, Tom Sainsbury said, I like that it wasn't the whole, I'm going to go spend more time with my family. It was, I'm off to do bigger and better things. So, um, Parliament will certainly be less leopard printy without her being there. And on that note, um, I'd like to apologise to Tina Tiller uh, for what happened last week's podcast. My name's Toby Van Hire and I humbly take your leave. Thank you, Annabelle. Thank you, Ben. Kaki te ano. Kaki te. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, senior writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, Brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBee. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.